All right, everyone, thank you so much. We're going to have a slow introduction. As you can tell, the quilting community, some people are very early, some people are on time. I assume some people are gonna come in the next 10 or 15 minutes as well. Um, but thank you all so much for coming out to the History Center on this beautiful evening. Uh, my name is Zoe Benostrand. Um, I coordinate our marketing and community engagement for the History Center. This is the second in our Community Quilt Making for Good series as part of the Not So Fast Patchwork of Tompkins County exhibit. If you haven't had a chance to see our quilt exhibit, really encourage you to do so. We're going to stay open after the event tonight. Also a good opportunity to silence cell phones. We are going to be recording tonight so that anyone who's not able to attend is able to watch. Um, the camera is only focused on the presenters. And so if you're not comfortable, don't worry. Maybe only your voice if you ask a question at the end. Um, not so fast, Patrick of Tompkins County is drawing from the fabric and textile collections held by the History Center. We have just about half of our quilt exhibits on display right now. This is really exciting to me because it shows that the practice of quilting, the hobby of quilting, the art of quilting is something that has been practiced continuously in this region for centuries. And there's not a lot of arts that you can say that about. And to understand the connection between the sewists and the patchwork artists that were operating in the 1820s, the 1880s, and then recognizing that the work they were doing of tying together community, tying together family, and also supporting local organizations and community programs and projects is very similar to the work that our quilters today have been doing in their lives in Tompkins County. So we're really excited to be able to honor and recognize this history and to really reflect more intensely on the literal thousands, for some of you probably tens of thousands of hours of work that have been put into creating these artworks that then go on to support other community programming and really capture the stories of Tompkins County. So that's kind of my broad piece. We had a couple people walk in, which is great. Um, and really excited to have you all here tonight. And also excited to announce that not so fast, originally we were going to be closing the exhibit in August. It is now going to be on display through the end of December. So you've got a whole nother two seasons to bring your friends and family to visit. So I'm gonna pass it over to Bridget. Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, welcome everyone. It's so wonderful for everyone to come out this afternoon. And I wanna especially thank Zoe and thank the History Center. Um, when you come into the space and place, if you've come into it for the first time, the History and Culture, well, Cultural Center is just so phenomenal. And this exhibit is top notch. We have so much to be proud of in our community that our History Center puts on an exhibit like this. So uh, thank you very much, and it's great that it's going till fall. And spread the word about this, because it really is a jewel that we don't think everyone knows about. So tell everyone about the Not So Fast exhibit. So I want to especially thank our panel today uh, for coming out um, from Ellis Hollow and Brooktondale and Dryden, and giving us a chance to celebrate you and honor you. Um, really, it's one, more than 132 years combined, which is incredible that you've been quilting in the community. So I'm Bridget Huberman, again, as Zoe said, and today I'm in the role of a volunteer for the Community Quilt Making Center. We've teamed up with the History Center to put on this uh, panel discussion because of our interest in opening the door to quilt making uh, for all, regardless of personal resources, and that comes directly from Peggy Dunlop, who has helped us found this new initiative. Um, and then a secondary interest and mission, which is looking out into the community and inspiring and supporting community good. And so um, there's been a lot of community good happening uh, for so long throughout, throughout history. People have, they've come together for so many different reasons to make quilts um, and, and we all have our list that is historical. Um, you know, first quilt makers getting together because of the necessity of it, but soon moving to joy and beauty and healing and well-being, social and emotional, and back to social again. And that's the part of this connecting. Um, in the exhibit, there are a number of quilts that have been made by groups, of course, not surprisingly, and some of them are contemporary and some of them are older, 
Um, there's a, an 1840 to 1850 wig rose that was made in Ludlowville, and there's also a, a wedding quilt uh, that was made by the Kretz family that's in that same time frame. Um, but this afternoon is really more about our own history in Tompkins County of quilt making with a special focus on community quilt making. And to give you that local history context, and there are uh, members of the Tompkins County Quilters Guild here this evening, um, that we in Tompkins County, in you know, certainly groups were getting together and making quilts long before this, but in 1974, a group got together and said, let's work on coming together and having a bicentennial quilt show. Raise your hand if you know about the bicentennial quilt show. I mean, 600 quilts. And you'll see that all over the community, um, that smaller, not just counties, but smaller groups in locales were making quilts. So you'll see right here is Ellis Hollows. We're so, thank you so much for bringing that to, tonight. It's really amazing. And then Caroline's, the Caroline Brooktondale area is in the exhibit. And then we think Dryden did one too, and we're gonna look and research that. So these bicentennial quilts are here. And where this overlaps is even before that, the Ellis Hollow quilts uh, group was making, was making their quilts in Ellis Hollow. And not too long since then, um, the Brookendale Quilts Group got started, and then Dryden Thimble Therapy Guild started. So our history, going far back, then merges into your history, um, and it's your history and stories that we look forward to hearing about this afternoon. So um, we're fortunate to have you in in person to talk about this history, and I want to introduce everyone on the panel. And, and they're going to go in order of being founded first. <laughs> so first we have Ellis Hollow and um, Sharon Turzik, am I saying, pronouncing that? And Beverly West. And the Brooktondale quilters are Nancy Hall and Peggy Dunlop. And then the Dryden Thimble Therapy Guild has Carol Funk and Judy Hogan. So let's get started. Everyone has a, a PowerPoint story. The backdrop of their story will be a visual one, of course. And so there will be 10 minutes as, that's what our plan is, um, uh, for each. So we're starting with Ellis Hollow Group. And then after those 10 minutes each, We'll move to some moderator questions, just a few questions that we'll ask each group, and conversation between, and then audience questions and audience uh, participation, things there are additional quilts people might have to show, um, and questions you have to ask. Okay, let's jump in. So, Ellis Hollow. Okay, can you give me okay? Oh, so we can no. the front no. panel right now? Okay. Let's try the front panel and then we'll see. What do you think? Good? Okay. And can everyone here in the back as we're getting going? No. Okay, so you need a little projection. Speak right into the microphone. Tip it, tip it, tip it up a little. Is that better? Yeah. Great. And let us know. We want you to be. Okay. Um, we put together this presentation, Sharon and myself, with Janice Bretcher, who's, I'm the informal historian, Sharon is our current leader, and Janice is sort of in the middle, but she's always on top of everything, and is so valuable at keeping up contact with our special earlier quilters. I think only one of them is here today, Elizabeth, in the yellow shirt, and we'll be hearing more about her. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you, Bridget, and the History Center for this fantastic quilt show and the opportunity to share the story of our cherished Ellis Hollow quilt tradition. Next slide. Ellis Hollow is more than six miles long, and the houses are just strung out all along this long, long road and its new neighbor and its near neighbors. So we had no center 
until in 1952, Mabel and Earl DeMott offered the corner of land at the intersection of the old uh, of Ellis Hollow and Turkey Hill Roads with the old schoolhouse for a community center. Several families, Shapley, Page, Post, Musgrave, Gates, jumped on the opportunity and the Ellis Hollow Community Association was born. Adjacent roads were included. The annual Ellis Hollow Fair began in 1952 on that plot and the schoolhouse was used for a nursery school. Next slide. In 1966, Donna Lemon suggested a quilt raffle as an idea to raise money for the community center. Forty women created squares to picture life in Ellis Hollow and quilted. This successful tradition has continued on a smaller scale for 57 years. Margaret Gerlach and Sally Norcross were contributed squares to that very first quilt. And worked on most of the subsequent quilts. Later quilts were designed by a number of people, among them yes, Carol Sienko with um, the toy quilt, Barbara Caldwell, one of hers was this garden quilt, Elizabeth Shriver. Can't see this very well anymore. Sally Norcross, Jim Mee Street, all of those people are designers. In the photo of the 1984 quilt, you see Jim Mee Street talking with Beryl Cushman, who is principal of Bell Sherman School. Uh, Ellis Hollow had both Bell Sherman and Caroline schools included. Um, Elizabeth's and Sally's Marshland Birds in 1999 was a real favorite. And I'll take this moment to show, say that Elizabeth designed 18 of our quilts. Wow. That's half of them from 1970 to 2005. Now, our most ambitious quilt on display was for the Bicentennial in 1976, and this was designed by Elizabeth, Kathy McCallman, and Susan Eister. There's an intricate design showing various eras in the U.S. history, with the U.S. Capitol at the center. And then around, immediately around that Pentagon, we have Native Americans, Pilgrims and the Mayflower, Plantation and Slaves, Boston Tea Party, and Washington crossing the Delaware. The next layer is at the bottom of the points, um, Betsy Ross and Ben Franklin, then Daniel Boone, Gold Rush and the West, immigrant pioneers with the riverboat, and Underground Railroad. Finally, at the tips, we have some um, typical decades. The top is 1890s. The next one is 1920s. Then we have 1930s, 1940s, and 1960s. Thank you. This bicentennial quilt was so special with lots of history represented that it was decided not to raffle that one off so that it could remain part of the history of Ellis Hollow. This created a dilemma. There wouldn't be a quilt to be raffled off and that would disappoint the community and be a financial loss to the fair. So next slide. Barbara Caldwell's daughter, Tilly, was approached to design a quilt to be created by the teenagers of the community since the moms were already busy with the bicentennial quilt. So at age 16, Tilly Caldwell designed her first quilt, the butterfly quilt, which was completed by about a dozen girls ranging in age from about nine to 17. 
keep that slide up. Since Sharon became our leader, the designing is now always a work in progress by all the quilters. We love to design our own quilts, which we start in October by choosing a theme and possible ideas. Everyone takes part. That's why our quilts are all so original, and everyone is still hand quilted. Making the design turn into an actual finished quilt is always a challenge, in a fun way. <laughs> New ideas keep us making modifications. So now let's go to 2016, the 50th anniversary of the year of the Ellis Hollow Quilt Raffle. A huge sign of the times was that by now, most women were working outside the home, so they had much less time for projects like quilting. Instead of 40 squares, we only got five historical pictures of Ellis Hollow, which we can see in the blow up in the center. So the next slide. We have the Fairview Barn, which looks down over the Ellis Hollow Community Center and the, where the fair is now. The Ellis Hollow Church, which is now a residence. Sharon's map in the middle. The Ellis Hollow Cemetery. And the old schoolhouse, which was our original community center. The 1966 quilting was done in Donna, Donna Lemon's home, where I saw it in progress when I moved to Ellis Hollow on June 30th, 1966. After that, the quilting was done in the new 1967 Community Center building for a few years. When that became awkward because of other groups using the building, Florence Rickard took us in for a year, and then it all went to Barbara Caldwell's home for 40 years. Wow. After Barbara died in 2009, one of our best embroidery and applique quilters, Joan Alburn, took us into her home for the next seven years. By then, Sharon had become our leader, and in 2016, we moved to Sharon's basement, where we're still working away and so glad to be together again after the pandemic pause. Sharon's husband, Dick, made us new stands for our quilting frame and helped many years, as have other husbands, getting the quilt set up to display at the fair at the Music in the Hollow events, and even here at the um, History Center event. Boy Scout Jeff Lance made us a new sturdy display frame as his Eagle Scout project in 2018, so that's what you see here. Our Ellis Hollow community works together in many ways. Okay, finally, next slide. By 2017, we quilters had really hit our stride with everyone contributing to the design. Our attic window had a cat looking out at the birds, and in the top left, you'll see a mouse in 3D, added by Vicki Brew and attached at the top by its tail. <laughs> 2018 gave us Midnight Magic, which had a lot of piecing instead of applique. So we switch around as we feel like it. For 2019, we were inspired by the tire swing at the community center, but we added fall leaves and a picket fence for balance. 2020 began the music in the hollow theme, but we had to put away the quilt and its quilting frame when COVID interrupted. We finally got to finish it in 2021 when the Ellis Hall Fair resumed. 2022 found us really back in business with oodles of owls, typical fun laying things out. It, individuals did the owls and then we had to figure out how to put them all together. It was, there was a thrilling win of this rally, raffle, I'm sorry, win of that raffle by our very own Tilly Caldwell Garnett, who wrote us a wonderful letter with lots of Ellis Hollow quilt history details. 
It's a wonderful way to support our community. Why do we keep quilting? The quilt raffle makes a goodly sum to help with expenses for the property, the building, the swimming pool, year-round Ellis Hollow community activities such as nursery school, Boy Scouts, 4-H, holiday fair, Scrabble evenings, and so on. In addition, we quilters get to relax after a long day, enjoy each other's company, heal, celebrate, share, enjoy tea and cookies, thank you Sharon, and people bring special cookies. The list goes on. We've all become good friends. The first three people pictured there are Pat Sims, Janice Brecher, and Elizabeth Schreiber, still in yellow. And <laughs> Margaret Gerlach is in the 2016 pictures, as is Sally Norcross. Neither of them could be here today, but um, they're still very important people to us. We give a shout out here to the quilters with the longest list of quilts worked on. Pat Sims is the champion at 37 years, starting in 1978 and still going. That's Pat you saw with the um, raffle yeah. in the bottom, the raffle thing. And um, Margaret, Sally, and Elizabeth Shriver each have totals around 30 years. I told you 18 were designing, but she's participated in at least 12 other quilts. For 2023, we have just a couple of photos, but the list of quilters is much longer, and you can see it on the table. I'm not going to read it for time. But we're especially grateful for Liz Eltzer and Janice Bretcher, two very special contributors to so many quilts. Liz sees the big picture and makes it happen. Janice can figure out new techniques for details, and here they're attaching the appliqued flowers to the background that Liz had created. Everybody contributes something special from offering encouragement, embroidery skills, quilting, to selling raffle tickets at every Music in the Hollow event during the summer. I wish you could have seen Jean Berg and Susan Mittler and how they did that. They never accepted a no. So let us close with an invitation to join the Ellis Hollow folk, to join us quilting, no experience needed, you'll just grow with us, and to everyone from wherever to come enjoy our fair and take chances on the quilt. The raffle tickets are still only $1 each, or six for five dollars. Thank you. So at this very moment, it's not quite complete, but we do have to show you this year's quilt. Let's do it in the front. This is, of course, you're allowed to take pictures. Yes, is that right, Beverly? Yeah. Everyone's allowed. It's a quick sneak peek. You can still buy your Apple tickets. Oh, and Pat oh, yes, I want to give a shout out to Pat, who's just arriving. You didn't hear, oh. but you have been working for the 37 years, longest for anyone else. Yeah. 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 And to the designers of this quilt, would you take hold it up just for one more minute, so? Sharon was telling stories about what it meant to people to embroider and maybe they didn't think they were good enough and then they learned more. And I think the, the heart and soul is always the people who gather together and they learn and grow and connect with each other no matter what, you'll see that common thread throughout. And, and I love those stories of what was stitched into this quilt and all of your quilts. So thank you so much, Beverly. Just a minute, my phone just came down. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, there we go. There we go.
Thank you. And thank you, Sharon. And would all of the other quilt makers here from Ellis Hollow please stand up so we can appreciate you and honor you. Yeah. We're going to all make sure we get tickets on that quilt for sure. And now the Brickendale quilters, and I think this microphone is going to work if you want to try that, Nancy and Peggy. Nancy Hall and Peggy Dunlop. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Okay. After having gone to several Ellis Hollow fairs, and I'm glad they came first in our uh, presentation this afternoon, I began to think that we could also do something like their raffle quilts. The Burtondale Community Center opened in 1964, just about the same time that my husband and I moved to Burtondale. And the Apple Festival in October became their signature fundraising event. For 10 years, the one raffle item that was offered was a color water, a watercolor um, portrait of the old mill in Brookendale that a local artist uh, contributed. But it raised about $75 each year. And I thought a quilt could do better and it could also bring women together. When we first moved to Brookendale, there was a cooperative extension home demonstration group where women got together maybe once a month and learned some new activity. Um, but that didn't last very long. So in the summer of 1974, I decided I would um, select some fabrics and make packets that I would distribute to 12 women that I knew sewed and it was a very um, quick kind of thing. We didn't have all the time to prepare that we did in later quilts, but everyone got their squares done and I sewed them together and added a border and then we set up the quilt frame in my living room. I had a, an antique quilt frame that was um, one of the ones where a large group of women can sit around it. Um, that quilt raised six over $600 for the community center and the difference in what it brought in was so significant that it became something that the center wanted us to continue doing. The next year, I also uh, picked the pattern and was one that I pretty much put together on my own. Um, but we all came together and began um, turning under the pieces uh, around my dining room table. And for many years, we met on Monday evenings around the dining room table in my house. We did all of those quilts, um, quilted all of those by hand, and we moved to Molly Adams' basement, which was cool and a place where we could leave our quilt frame set up and did our quilting during the summer months because the Apple Festival always came in October. When we began, we decided that Ellis Hollow had um, always designed very original quilts, but we wanted to follow um, traditional patterns. And that's what we started out doing and did for the most part. There were a few times when we decided to design our own quilts and I think they were less successful. Some of the people in the group felt that they didn't have the artistic talent to be able to do it. And in the end, we were generally happier with the quilts that we made following traditional patterns. So we might make a few minor changes to traditional patterns. 
we continued um, making the quilts each year and the amounts that they made went up sometimes to over $3,000, generally more in the $2,000 range. But where we had really special uh, applique quilts and we did applique quilts for most of those years because there wouldn't be the difference in the seam allowances of people doing piecework quilts. In um, around 19, uh, around 2006, I began finding that there were very few people left in the original group. They would either passed away or had moved. And I began doing more of the quilts on my own, sometimes a couple of people helping me um, choose the design or making color that choices. In the back. Just um, and the one, the quilt in the far back is the first one that I did completely on my own. And that was the first quilt that we had long arm quilted as opposed to hand quilted. That one I did from the uh, Stack and Whack um, book. And um, as I say, I began working on my own a lot with consulting with a few people I knew about their ideas for it until uh, 2015 when I announced in a Brookendale Community Center newsletter that I was no longer going to continue doing it. If the tradition was to continue, we needed to find someone else and a new group to do it. And that is when Nancy Hall stepped up and said that she would do it. And she got a group of younger women involved. Um, and she has continued to do it ever since. I've tried over those years to still take part in it so that I'm the longest serving member at 49 years. This year I have not been able to do much other than to submit pattern ideas. Um, but over the years, I was the one that usually found the fabrics that we used for the quilt because I had a textiles and clothing background I shopped for the fabrics and because I found it so time consuming and frustrating going from fabric shop to fabric shop trying to find a, a color or pattern that we were looking for, I began collecting fabrics that we could then um, select what we needed for our next quilt and that grew to be quite a collection as some of you know because I ended up donating it to Finger Lakes Reuse for the purpose of establishing a community uh, quilt making center um, there. And I'm glad to know that the Dryden group has their group named uh, Thimble Therapy in that um, one of the things we found was that our quilting group served as a therapy group in the early years when we met around my dining room table. We did so much sharing of the situations we were dealing with in our families that it really was a, a therapy group as well as um, a, a group doing community good at the same time. So I'll turn it over to Nancy Hall now. I do have in addition to the quilt back there, I brought another quilt that was one of our raffle quilts of one of my neighbors won. Um, and when she moved away from Brookendale, she sold it to me. This was one of our hand quilted, hand -quilted quilts. Uh, the one, um, in the back, I don't know if I said that my husband, I told someone earlier, and I don't know if I just now said that um, because I had made that quilt on my own, I wouldn't sell my husband any raffle tickets. <laughs> and, 
I said it would be too awkward if he should win it. But unbeknownst to me, as he left the Apple Festival to go to a Cornell football game, he handed someone a $20 bill and said, buy me some raffle tickets. <laughs> no one could have been more surprised when his, one of his raffle tickets was pulled. <laughs> I knew another man had spent $150 on raffle tickets because he wanted that quilt so badly. And I said, oh, you know, I think we should give it to him. But then my daughter spoke up and said, no, mom, I bought raffle tickets too, and I bought it. So that's why it's here. Well, in comparison to some of you other ladies, not that I'm a new quilter, but I'm new to the group quilting process. And I did take it over in 2016. That's kind of the leader of the group. And the group will tell you that I'm kind of like the hardcore quarter inch seams ladies, you know. Um, because we do also work on the quilt. We do all sew on it together. Um, we don't limit it to just a couple of people. Whoever wants to help can help. Um, this year is our 60th Apple Festival, and because of that, we're making two raffle quilts this year. One of them is in the back corner, uh, the very brightly colored one. And uh, the second one is still in progress. Um, this one will be raffled off at the end of August, and the other one will be raffled off at our Apple Festival this fall. So, um, please come. August, it'll be our zucchini festival. October is the apple festival. So, that's about all I have to say. <laughs> so, I didn't realize that was going to be a slideshow, so it just kept moving. So, that was the 50 years, almost 50 years of. Bluffton-Dale quilts, and this is a poster that I think it was will be next year. That's we'll next year. So Betsy McKean has created a, pic, a, a poster of all of those quilts. Thank you so much, Nancy. We'll have more chance. And then welcome to, Car to Carol Funk and to Judy Hogan. Thank you so much for. Is this on? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, our story is a little different. Let's begin to the end of it. You get a this way. Right to your mouth. Yeah. Right okay. up, swallow it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, our story is a little different um, because we came together in uh, 1995. Uh, Twenty uh, ladies from the uh, Dryden and Freeville and Cortland area came together to form the Dryden Thimble Therapy Group, and. Um, we meet every month, the uh, second and fourth Tuesday of the month, and we meet at the Dryden Presbyterian Church in Dryden. And we've had as many as 32 people, and um, now we have probably 20, I think, that um, usually come. And um, we work on our own projects, but every once in a well, quite often, we have um, a project quilt or we have what we call quiltathon. And when we were a lot younger, when we started, we used to meet from 10 in the morning till 10 at night. And um, we, would, we would quilt the whole time. And um, usually it was quilts that we wanted to make to give away. And um, some of the uh, quilts that we have given uh, family in Dryden were completely burned out and so um, at one of them, I don't see it up there yet. But at one of them, um, we made five quilts in one day. Um, and there were probably 30 of us that day working on it. Um, but the, our quiltathons are a lot of fun because we have lunch together and uh, quilt and play games and then usually have go out for dinner. And um, so, let's see. Oh, those are the quilts that we made. Um, for the family that burned out. And the other quilt is a quilt of valor that we made. And we made a number of those also. And um, we partnered with the YWCA in Cortland um, a number of years ago. And um, we've made num probably hundreds of quilts. 
in one year we made 77 and another year 82 and another year 71 and um, we hope to partner with the um, Second Wind Project in Newfield. And um, Judy, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. The, the Second Wind House, it, there's one in Newfield that uh, houses men, and there's going to be one in Dryden that houses women. And um, so I have contacted them and they will be back in touch with me when they need them. But in the meantime, we've been making some little quilts, um, some bigger quilts for them. Yep, Judy, do you want to show us some of them? Um, so these are some of the little quilts that we're, oh, we're going oh, to give yeah. away to the Second Wind mm -hmm. House. There, a lot of them are all just scrap pieces. We like scrappy quilts. Yeah, our group, very scrappy quilts. Well, we're all the same age, where we have so much fabric, and we need to start getting rid of it. This is a panel. And somebody uh, that one of the girls completed. Oh, that's good. And again, this is just a very scrappy quilt for kids. We've got some other ones. You want to show these? Sure. These are quilts that our members have made over the years. Um, this is an English paper piecing one. English paper piecing. Um, does Anita do hers by hand? Anita does, yes, all hers by hand. And then it, uh, but it's been quilted on a, a, a long arm. And this quilt is by Anita also, and uh, she just. But she is so prolific, you would not believe the quilts that she produces. <laughs> and this is a quilt that I made for my daughter a number of years ago, but it's um, all hand quilted. And um, it took me a long time. Um, it was, uh, her decor actually changed twice before I finished the quilt. <laughs> Actually, in our family, we call it the quilt from hell because it, because it was. Take a corner, just so we can bring it to the center. And then, because we have to show the back, right? Yeah. Wow. yeah. So there it is. And that was done with a long hair. No, this no, is hand this quilted. This is all hand quilted. Oh my God. This is all hand quilted. Oh how many <laughs> stitches do you think? Oh. Yes. How many wow. hours in a quilt? And how many Years. Years. Yeah. And then we'll turn it. There was a whole Irish chain. Is everyone? This is a triple Irish chain. Yeah. This feels. Doesn't it feel like the circa Irish chain time? Yeah. It was the right late nineties. Yeah. Well, it's just fabulous. Wow. Thank you for bringing all these to share. And um. Our next um, group that we are going to partner with is the um, Grace Brown House in Cortland. And it's a new facility for homeless women and children. And um, one of our quilters, um, it's for women um, who have been abused and um, for children. And one of our quilters went through that as a young uh, person. And so she's become very involved with the group that are doing this. And so I think we've donated about 40 quilts to that group already. So um, uh, Judy, you want to talk a little bit about the pandemic and what we did during the pandemic? Our meeting where we met? During the pandemic, of course, we couldn't meet. And so um, we met one summer 
it was the summer of 2020, 2020, and we met in one of the girls' yard, and we just hand quilted the whole time. It was just, we just, the whole summer, we just had an absolute ball, just coming with our lunch and sitting out under this shade tree and quilt, 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 and talk, 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 talk. <laughs> So that's kind of our story, um, and um, hopefully we'll continue, uh, you know, quilting and giving away our quilts in the future. Thank you. Carol, I'm going to turn you. So how often do you have a quilt show? This, these next slides are from the Dryden quilt show. So, actually, we've had two uh, quilt shows. And for the number of uh, people that are in our group, it was amazing, the collection of quilts that we uh, were able to put together. And we also had a tea room. And that was really interesting because so many of the people that came just thought that that was so wonderful to be able to look at quilts and then sit down and have a cup of tea and crumpet. So, we had so Carol, what year is this particular show? I mean, we had yeah. one in 2013 and one in 2017. And we um, piggybacked on the uh, quilt show um, that the guild does yes. and so we a lot of people and we had a big sign out in front of the church so a lot of people that were going to the uh, big quilt show stopped in at our show it was a lot of fun I thought that was a great feature because you got two for one yeah <laughs> we went to the quilt show at Cortland Community College and then could stop at Dryden for your show and are all these quilts from your Dryden yes. Thimble Therapy Guild? Right. All of these quilts are from, how many do you, how many people do you have now? You said about 20? Um, about 20 now, but then we probably had maybe 30 people. Wow. Amazing. But it filled the sanctuary, a huge meeting room, a small meeting room. Um, yeah, it was. They go on and on. Are, the, are these slides from two different shows? Yes. Okay. That makes us feel a little better. Because <laughs> we need to quilt more and faster. <laughs> wow. These are amazing and beautiful. And I love hearing your stories about the quilts and the service quilts that, they, that you've done and where they've gone. And um, someday our dream with Community Quilt Making Center is to have a list of what everyone's doing in the whole community so we kind of know what's out there as possibilities and, and what's happening. Um, and there we go. Thank you so much. Well, that was just amazing and incredible and stories and visual stories and real quilts to see and talk about. And, and now um, we've got some questions for you. Some of you may be ready to answer them or they may be relevant to you and, and some of you they may not. And be ready with your questions in the audience because we'll go kind of back and forth with questions, okay? Um, so, Thinking about the social and emotional well-being that we talked about, um, that are that are so inherent for many of us and why we quilt, I wanted to uh, have each of you answer to take a moment just to talk about yourself or talk about someone in your group or something, how how your group has been a special part of life for people who are involved and well-being. Anyone have a story or something to tell? Well, our group, like I said, we've been meeting since 1995, and a number of the women have um, gone through chemo, uh, cancer and chemo and um, health issues, and our group has really been uh, a support for them. And unfortunately, so many of our um, members, their husbands have died, and um, so, that's been a real, uh, we've, hopefully we've been a real support group for them, and I think we have, don't you, Judy? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, sometimes we come, last week I think we came, and there were eight of us, and most of us sat around and talked. We really didn't have anything to work on, but we just sat around and visited. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. That connection to community. Yeah. Yeah. Nancy? Um, one of the funny things is going back through the series of pictures we have working on our quilts. People were commenting, oh, your hair's gotten long, your hair's gotten short. <laughs> I was one of those women who had breast cancer and went through chemo. And there are a number of pictures of me early on where I'm totally bald or wearing a hat and it's come back and they keep looking down and they go, you have hair again. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it is, it's a great, uh, just a great sense of support from the other women in the community. Sure. Um, we have. Uh, it's on, but it's not. You want to hold it? Just oh, hold it closer. closer. Okay. Um, there isn't a person in our our group that doesn't come to quilting with some sort of issue. I mean, none of us is. I mean, I don't mean it in a negative way, but we all we all have our problems, and I find that the. Um, the relaxation and the relief that our, our women, including me, uh, feel when we all get together. Um, you know, you can feel your blood pressure starting to go down a little and your shoulders relaxing a little bit. And, you know, sometimes people come and they really are too upset to quilt. I mean, that has happened. And they'll just have a cup of tea and cookies with us, which is wonderful. And we like to be very supportive of our our quilters, um, one, of, one of the women who's not here uh, lost her two brothers within nine months of each other. Um, and that was it for the family, but just the two boys. And she was very upset. And she came one night um, during, I think after the second brother had passed away. And we all knew you know, that she was grieving. And um, we gave her, it was for the uh, music in the hollow quilt, which we had musical Can instruments. Everyone here in the back, I just wanna make sure Sharon, because this is, would you, would you give, okay. you know, this is just such a beautiful story. I wanna make sure everyone okay. can hear it. So uh, this, this particular lady had lost two of her brothers and she, we all knew about it and she had come to quilting and it was the uh, music in the hollow quilt that we were working on that night, that year. And I had just happened to buy a, a box of little decorative, little tiny decorative buttons. Um, we all sat down and we were starting to, you know, to do our thing. And she took those, that little box of buttons and she spread them out in front of the saxophone and she, that was applique, and she started very carefully arranging each little button coming out of that saxophone mm -hmm. so that it looked like music was coming out of the sax. Mm -hmm. And that was her healing for yeah. her that night. And we just, we just let her go, and you know, she made a beautiful, beautiful design and we sewed all those little itty bitty buttons on and I always think of her when I see a picture of that quilt. And then there was another, this story I love also, it's a, a story about a woman who, um, she's in the nighttime quilting group. We have two groups. We Tuesday night are the, the, the nighttime, the people who work during the day tend to be a little bit younger than us. Uh, the Wednesday afternoon were the retirees. So, um, and we have our own personalities in terms of a group too. The, one of the women who comes to the nighttime group <coughs> is from uh, Argentina. And she, um, she's at Cornell. She, uh, I won't talk much about that part of her life right now because I don't want to give it away. But when she was growing up, her mother wouldn't let her so much as sew a button on a, an item. Her mother was a seamstress and she said she wanted something better for her daughter than to be a seamstress. So she wouldn't let her do anything. And her daughter went along and got her doctorate. She's got a very, 
important job at Cornell. She started, she joined our quilt group maybe five or six years ago, and all she wanted to do that she felt comfortable with at first was ironing, and she would press and press and press. And little by little, she started picking up the needle and thread, and um, with this particular quilt, some of the most beautiful flowers on this were done by this woman who has come into her own and she just loves it and she uses it for a hobby. So I, I guess I could go on, but that, those are the two, two stories that I like to tell. Those are the kinds of stories we love to hear. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sharon. The other piece in that story that Sharon told is thinking about how we encourage and support younger people to find their way into quilt making. How do we open the door? And that your community that you decided to have an additional night is just really quite special. And I think it's something we'll all have conversations about, about bringing into quilt making. Um, does anyone else have a story about younger people bringing in younger people to your groups and, and have any thoughts on how how to do that? And, and there may be people in the audience as well who have done some thinking about younger people and how to bring them in. We'll all stir on that. Okay. That sounds good. Peggy, do you want to take a moment just to share about Eleanor Abbott or any, or if you have another person in mind who you felt that quilt making was transformative for, who had not picked up a needle? Eleanor, Eleanor Abbott lived in Brookendale and oh, probably 15 years after our group started, um, Eleanor began coming. We were working on the Wig Rose quilt at that time, which was one of the ones I love best of, of the quilts we made. And Eleanor had never quilted before, but she ended up making a Wig Rose quilt to give her son as a wedding gift before we had finished our, our group quilt. She then went on to get, she, it, she really got into quilt making and eventually quit her job at Cornell to teach quilting and to hand quilt, quilts for other people. Um, when she passed away, she had such a collection of fabulous quilts that she had made. And this was, we were at the beginning of it for her. She had never quilted before she came to our group. Um, I again have to say the, the support that people in a quilt group give each other is, is so very special. I particularly felt it with this new group of um, people getting involved with the community quilt making center. Um, we only began getting together late last summer or early fall, and we really couldn't do very much um, until more recently when we had the space available. But just the people that came together to help plan this just felt like such a close group already. And when my, I lost my husband the beginning of February, they reached out to me in such a, a special way that um, I love the fact that community is part of the title of this new quilt making center because I really believe that that's such an important element of it to, to pro provide community for each other uh, as well as opportunities to learn to sew, to quilt, to design, whatever, and have everything available that you need in order to do it. Thanks, Peggy. Are there any questions in the audience for the panel? Anything that you heard that you want to hear more about? I've got some more questions, but I wanted to check in with you first and see. Zoe? So I haven't been to um, Ellis Hollow or Brookendale fairs since I was quite young. Like, how much 
in terms of like thinking about how your quilting work supports the fair and supports the programming there like how much do you really raise every year with that how does that kind of impact you know that other beloved community tradition we um we raffle our our quilt off at the alice hollow fair uh every year and um there have been times when we've made a, a whole lot of money like three thousand dollars uh, but that was a number of years back when the fair had more um, more of an emphasis on, on homemade things. Um, when we started in my basement, um, I think we were bringing in maybe our first quilt that we did maybe six or seven years ago could have been under a thousand dollars someplace. I, I've forgotten exactly when, but uh, now we have someone who actually prints our tickets out for us, so we don't have to subtract that from our, our proceeds. And last summer, uh, that that person printed all, printed 2,000 tickets. And thanks to the efforts of Jean, who is sitting right there, and Susan, who sell tickets at the Music in the Hollow every summer. Um, there were 2,000 tickets sold. Uh, there were 2,000 tickets printed. So, you know, it would have to be over $2,000 um, because we do a dollar a ticket or six for $5. You need to charge more. <laughs> you know, we have talked about it, but- You could. Yeah, I know. In fact, we were. In fact, we. I got an email just last night asking, "What do you think? Should we double the price?" And I said, "No, I've already got this printed. It's on the slides. It's one dollar. But this might be the last year." That's good to know. How, how much do Burtondale tickets cost? We sell our tickets for the same amount: a dollar a piece or six for five. And the Tompkins County Quilters Guild at the quilt show. A dollar each and six for five? Same. 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 Yeah. Wow. It's really interesting, and we could have a 25-minute conversation about this alone. But the, so if you made it $2, would you sell half as much? That's the question. Wow. And um, always, and, and, and might you add a dollar each and seven for five um, to get people to do that $5? It's just... Everyone here could come up with their own uh, plausibility study and how much you'd sell. But I know for sure that all of us want to buy raffle tickets on your on your quilts. Yeah. So. And we, we have honestly have very few people who only buy singles. Most people do buy the $5, so. Already. And yeah. we are pushing $2,500 a quilt at this point wow. with our sales, so. And that supports a lot of the programming and activities at the community center. Mm -hmm. so. At one point, it was the single largest fund that the, the center got. It made more than the apple pies that were sold at the Apple Festival. So it became um, very important to the center that we continue making the quilts. Carol and Judy, have you ever thought of doing a, a raffle quilt? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> just wonder, just wonder. Did, did we do one? And it was just among our group, though. I think we raffled it off. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe it made $200, but that was that was a number of years ago. Yeah. Would one you, of the things that, oh, someone has a question? Well, I was going to say, you have some nice driving events where the Southworth House and other right. events where you could do a raffle. The possibilities out there. Um, yes, we could. <laughs> one of the great things about getting groups together, and and there are likely, I know there's a group starting in Enfield, you know, the groups that are based in locales and communities. I think that Linda Van Adreinen has been involved in that. And if others know about uh, community-based groups in Tompkins County, I think there are some different church groups. But one of the wonderful things about getting together is just sharing um, what everyone's doing and 
you may say, well, that's not for us. Like, and, and you may say, oh, well, let's do something like Dryden's doing. And that's the beautiful thing is that we all get to learn from each other. I can bring this microphone around too. Um, there was a period of time when we had a community member who was very aware of where everyone worked in the community and she took on the raffle ticket sales and she made sure that every person who worked for a different company or in a different building at Cornell or Ithaca College had a packet of raffle tickets to take to work with them. And her very organized approach to getting those raffle tickets in the hands of different people to sell at their workplaces did bring in more money um, in advance. In fact, the advance raffle tickle sales made a huge difference in the total amount that were, were, was taken in because there are only so many you can sell on the day of the event. Exactly. And the advance sales made a huge difference. We weren't taking the quilt around to things like the downtown um, Apple Festival or different things. Um, uh, we just got the tickets with photos of the quilt around to different venues. The Quilters Guild makes a lot on their raffle quilts by um, giving all the members uh, packets of, I guess it's 25 tickets that they're expected to, to sell or, or else buy themselves. Um, and um, Is Tompkins County Quilters Guild half sold before the show and about half sold at the show? That's my recollection of it. And that may be similar to the amounts of what, of what you're doing as well. Okay, questions, yes. I, I would like to know, um, I, I just have realized recently that I've had this image of women getting together quilting over the years and I, I just realized that I, that image was of women coming together, sitting around a big frame and quilting, doing that, you know, hand stitching and everything, which I have a friend who's a, an avid quilter now, and she has a long arm and does quilting for other people and everything. And, and I don't know why, but just recently it dawned on me, I was like, oh, so they probably don't all get together and sit around one frame anymore. And I asked her and she said, well, we come together, but we all have our own projects and such, and, and we'll just be together working on our own projects. And I just wonder, in regards to the community and tying that into the quilts, um, how, how do you feel like when you see a quilt that all of you have contributed to, how do you feel about that in re, um, as a difference between the quilts that you've worked on by yourselves, even though you get together and you quilt together, but you're all working on your own project. How do you feel about the quilts that you work on all together? They're all ours. They all belong to all of us. And they're just as much mine doing it in a group as they are doing it individually. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so when you're you have your own quilt finished. You think of this as like your quilting sisters and oh, everyone yeah. together. Yeah. yeah. You all take ownership of the same on, on each other's quilt. No. No, Not, no. individually oh, it's your quilt. quilt. But when we work on a group quilt, it's still individually each of our quilts. So I don't have time anymore to do any individual quilts, although I did long ago. So being, being able to go to a group quilt with other people and get something done, it's amazing. And we all share ownership of it. That and, means something. And so most of the quilts that you all work on in your groups are really a, a, a group effort on, on that. Yeah. With, with yeah. us, yes. We, we had to quilt the whole thing around a, a quilting frame that um, actually a, a Boy Scout made for, um, it was Sally Norcross's son 
who made our quilting frame, which is pretty ancient, but it's, and, and I have to say, I'm not gonna give it up. <laughs> I have to say, some of the quilts are harder to give away than others. I mean, when we draw the winning ticket, you know, it's kind of a letdown. And it's a thrill when you know who the person is who won the quilt. But there are some times when we don't know who won the quilt. And it's, you know, that music in the hollow quilt, when I handed it to the, the man who won it, I said, take good care of this. <laughs> and yes, yeah, Sally's son made the first quilting frame, but by the time we were in your basement, it was yeah, too so old and it. your husband fixed it, yeah. made us new frames. Other questions and uh, or comments or uh, anything? I didn't mention this quilt. Pat Harvey in our group made that, and I don't know if anyone's familiar with this program, but Moda uh, Fabric Company does what they call blockhead Moda blockheads, and they this is the fourth one, and um, every week they post. For 35 weeks, Judy? Yeah, 30, 35, 39. They, they post a different block. A different pattern. A different pattern. Pattern, block. And Pap used all fabric she had in her stash. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, to do that. Just so that it was just a scrappy quilt, but it's all individual blocks. They, Mona comes out with it once a week. Mm -hmm. and I we, think it starts in September, doesn't it? Well, this particular one started in the summer. Oh, okay. And we all waited for it, and we you get your fabric together and start putting them together, and then, oh my gosh, the next one came out already. <laughs> <laughs> so how many people worked on this? Just Pat. Oh, oh, oh. We all did our own. Oh, wow. I think four or five of the women made, uh, yeah. made blockhead. Yeah. Four. And they, 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 this particular one came out in two different sizes, nine and a half, and uh, I saw it here, four oh, and a half. I saw, I thought I it's saw one. It's down there, down at the left hand corner. This one also is four different blocks, four and a half each. That would be a good way to use orphan blocks. If you collected orphan blocks True. from people and got all the ones that were of the same size, um, you could put them together in a, a pattern like this and put them into good use. And um, Pat said to mention that Moda is going to do another one uh, starting in the fall. So it would be Moda Blockhead 5. And it's you can pick it up off of your um, the internet. It's free. Yeah. It's free. free. I wanted to also invite um, any of the group that's come from the Brooktondale Quilt Lakers to stand if they're here. And and then any others from Dryden Thimble Therapy come along with you, the, your guild. That's all right. They're home quilting, clearly, getting ready for the next show. We can, we can tell. So, well, any questions that you have for each other? And again, one, Barbara? This is Barbara Dimmick, and it sounds like you're going to have this quilt because Tom bought a, your husband Tom bought a ticket. No, he didn't know. <laughs> when they called and told him he won, he didn't know that he even bought a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> my, my husband won this. But because you must have bought him a ticket. I bought it. We knew the ticket was bought. By someone. Can everyone see that? We will. Let me move this oh, way, everyone. What was the name of that? 
Woodland Animal. Woodland Animal, 2002. And I should add that Barbara and Tom designed one of our quilts, the Ellis Hall Rose, which was more the traditional. More traditional. Let's give one more look this way, Barbara, just to make sure. Everyone sees all the woodland animals. So some of you may remember what animals you did. That's great. Thank you, Barbara. Any other quotes? Yes, Joanne. I have a question for the Ellis um, Hollow folks. When you um, are ready to start one of your posts, this is a question for the Ellis Hall group. Uh, when you're ready to start your quilt, how do you go about designing it? Do you like have somebody or several somebody sit down and draw the picture? Because very often they're pictures, right? And you just turn them into quilts. So how do you do that? So originally, Janice and a number of chuckles throughout the <laughs> Janice. <laughs> Originally, people like Elizabeth did provide us with a design, but by the time Sharon took over, we meet in her living room in October, and everybody has quilt books and magazines and so forth, and we look around, and then they get put on the table, and we vote with pennies. <laughs> and it has, takes two or three rounds, but we come up with something that we're all willing to work on, and then we adapt it to our own desires. That sounds, I love that penny voting. <laughs> how about you, Nancy and Peggy, when you're, when, how, how do you decide? We generally have everybody bring in pictures of quilts that they like, and we, again, same thing, throw them out in the middle of the table, and we usually start with somewhere between 30 and 40, wow. and then look at them for a while, <laughs> pass them around, have everybody pick like the one or two that they like the most, so it eliminates everything else, and then we narrow it down to one per person, and then vote on it from there. One per person, vote. yes, Carol. And who picks the fabric and the colors? And who picks the fabric That's a group the decision. We always do it as a group decision. Yeah. And, yeah. and they can't go to Peggy's Barn anymore no. to do that, so they're going to have to come to the Community Quilt Making Center or somewhere else. Did you have something else? Uh, I think in our case, um, Sharon, Liz, Janice, and others, you know, they go off. Sharon will say, I'll go to Quilters Corners this week, who can come? And then they come back with some choices for us. and. We, True. Anyone else in the audience besides Tompkins County Quilters Guild that does a raffle quilt or that is doing service quilts? I know there are, there's the uh, a group through uh, Quilters Corner that has been doing service quilts, so it's always good to hear about them. Any other questions that anyone has? We're, we're inviting everyone to stay and look much more closely at these quilts that are so beautiful. And is it true that you have some tickets already for sale on the Burtondale quilt? And Alice Hollow has done a whole, whole book of their quilts. Um, and those are here and for sale. And we'll wrap up in just a minute. Yes. I have a question for Dragon mm -hmm. and your service quilts that you make. Have you, have you all had anybody who has received one of those quilts come back to you and say, I received a quilt, or anybody that has told you a story related to your the quilts that you have made? And everyone here is wondering Every, about, okay, good. Every, yes, um, in the uh, packet you of, you your mic. Oh, right. thank you so much. Um, in the packet of information that uh, Phyllis Smith gave uh, me, she's, retired now from quilting and um but there were a number of thank you beautiful thank you notes and thank you letters um that um people have sent to us thanking us and um i think a couple of times uh one young woman uh, young girl um was pregnant and really sad story 
and we made a beautiful quilt for her and a baby quilt. And um, she came and thanked us personally, besides the thank you note that she sent. So that, that was really special. And then the family that we made the quilts for, that um, they lost everything in a fire. And we, it was just a beautiful note that we received from them uh, because everything was gone. And now they had these five quilts uh, you know, that were very, very special for them. What an inspiring time hearing all of you speak and, and seeing all those one after another gorgeous quilts. And thank you so much for being here and, and sharing in this way. And, and really, um, we honor you and we celebrate you and all the difference that all those quilts have made in our community. Think of, think of them, think of that, wow. So thank you so much. And I wanna, well, let's give a round of applause first. I wanted to wrap up by saying a few words about the Community Quilt Making Center that is new. Um, first, that it isn't a quilt shop. You may have, since Finger Lakes Reuse sells things, you may have imagined that it's a shop tucked in to the Mega Reuse Center, but in fact, it's a quilt making center and the vision of uh, opening the door to quilt making for all, regardless of personal resources, um, is really actualized by um, experienced quilt makers who want to share and help aspiring quilt makers and so doing that matchmaking um, we have in coming this Sunday is an open Sunday uh, quilt making and sewing and that is from one to four we're really trying to keep that uh, through all the Sundays in May um, if you have skills that you want to share if you want to mentor a new quilt maker there's lots of opportunities we've never done a quilt making center before so we're really finding our way um, there are lots of wonderful people involved and, and thanks to peggy and we're so happy to uh, partner with the history center in making this presentation come come alive and i i we have community quilt making center people here and i'll ask you to stand as well and thank you for being a part of a new making it up as we go. Thank you. I'm Camila. I'm Camila. I'm the voice at the table who keeps saying, before someone can make a quilt, they probably need to know how to turn on a sewing machine and maybe thread it. But some of the people who have approached us have never picked up a needle and thread. So when we ask for, for you folks to come and give us a hand, um, it might not be quilt making. It might be teaching somebody how to sew a straight line. And that's what we've learned already. That's really one-on-one. -on -one. So we can use as much help as you can give us to come and see if there are folks who are brand new to sewing. Maybe they just want to start with mounting the seam. But uh, we hope to turn them on to quilt making. And this is at the Reuse Center. Yes. Yeah. At Trip Hammer. Wow. Yes. In a great big room, it is. And, um, and you'll see uh, coming soon more offerings that there will be. Um, and, and just as we imagined, um, at the grand opening, there were many people there and, and lots of interest from people who hadn't, who wanted to make a quilt but never had and hadn't been in a quilt shop and, and hadn't tried and maybe didn't so. And on Sunday, that was our first Sunday since, there were a number of people who sat down and started cutting out fabric and putting it together that hadn't had that opportunity before. So it feels to us like real confirmation that, that we are going to be able to open the door uh, to quilt making for many who haven't had that opportunity. So it's exciting. So any, um, any uh, did you get a chance to ask any additional questions of each other? Is there any last word that any of you want to say? It's, to say one little thing and that's that everybody has some some skill or some strength to bring to a quilting group um, you might not know what it is when you join but you you will find it as you go along so don't don't think that you can't do it and I want to thank Bridget again for the chance to meet with these other groups I'm really glad that we 
come together. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, and please do stay. If you haven't seen the exhibit yet, it's open right now. Uh, you're welcome to, to do that tour. You're going to need to come back again, of course, because you won't have enough time. And, and please, this is quite extraordinary to have the Ellis Hollow Bicentennial quilt here. Um, the Caroline one is in the exhibit, and, and enjoy the quilts. Buy some of the first raffle tickets. The first raffle tickets win, of course. I have a few and, extras of the description of the Bicentennial quilt. Oh, great. And then, again, the Ellis Hollow quilts, uh, 50 years, are for sale. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you.